So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce Megan Dawson, who is one of our fantastic um, LGBT Legal Clinic volunteers and just an all-around fantastic person. Um, and she and Lara and one of our former, um, one of last year's um, clients of the second parent adoption clinic we did are going to talk to you about how to work with multiply marginalized families and um, get a sense of kind of what some of the best practices are, what family diversity actually looks like on the ground, and what these court processes feel like from the perspective of people who have gone through them. So, thank you, Megan. Okay, uh, thanks for having me. Um, we are actually gonna bring up the client from last year's clinic first. Uh, we were hoping to uh, piggyback on Laura's presentation about what it looks like from the social worker perspective. Um, and we're gonna have the parent talk about what it looks like as a queer parent um, going through the court process. So if there are questions, I think that she'd be happy to receive those as well. Um, and if you could just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. But uh, without further ado, if Andy, uh, Lyons can come up. Thank you. Um, should I say anything? Okay. Yeah, you can okay. say whatever you want. Okay. Um, hey, so I, um, I'm actually really grateful to be here. I mentioned that um, we just have overwhelming gratitude to QLaw um, that we were able to be a part of this process. Um, so just a little background about um, my family. Um, I, um, I have a partner and we have two children. Um, the oldest one was conceived in Denver um, where we moved from um, using a friend who was a donor. Um, and when we started that process, um, there were no sorts of relationship protections in Colorado. Um, and uh, as we pro progress through the process, eventually we were able to sort of secure um, a domestic partnership and then a civil union and then a, um, a legal marriage. Um, but that was after our son was born. Um, so we had that one case, I carried that child. Um, we moved out to Washington when he was about 18 months old. And um, then my partner carried our second child who was conceived using anonymous donor um, for logistic and many other complicated reasons. So ours, part of the reason that we um, had a lot of anxiety and trepidation about even kind of setting foot into the process was that we had this sort of complicated, um, try, not, I guess, quad, quad I don't know, whatever, <laughs> cross kind of situation um, that not only was that we, um, we each then needed to adopt um, the child we weren't biologically related to, but we also had um, to figure out some other pieces around the donor. Um, and so we actually just put it off and we didn't do it because, um, we figured we had marriage protection, um, things felt like pretty solid. We live in a progressive state. Um, our families are both pretty supportive, so we weren't concerned about those pieces. And then of course the last election happened and things kind of felt like they were uh, less solid. Um, and so at that point, we started looking into the process of potentially um, doing it pro se. Uh, because we couldn't afford um, a lawyer. Um, and we called around and talked to um, social workers and we realized we couldn't afford social workers either um, because we were gonna have to do the dual. So all the social workers we talked to said, okay, we're, we'll charge you this twice, right? To do each because they're different reports. Um, and so we were like, okay, well, we financially, we, we can't do this. It's, uh, it's out of <laughs> the scope. Um, and so we just put it off and continue to feel a lot of anxiety. We're really lucky. I mean, we're both white. Um, we are middle class. Uh, we're well educated. So I think we um, had that protection. But 
was still anxiety producing. And then of course we got the opportunity to do it through CULA. Um, so the financial piece got handled really easily, right? That was a huge relief um, to not have to do that. And to know that in addition to the social worker fees being covered, which was the big expense for us, um, figuring like we, we're well-educated people, we can like make a go at trying to figure out a legal process. Um, but there's also the fear of like, are you gonna make a mistake? Is that gonna like ruin the chances, right? If we don't file it in the right place or sign it like this or understand something, um, are we gonna get in legal trouble um, for doing whatever? Do we have to do this two cases? Like what's the process? Um, so it was great to just have that confidence. Um, and we worked with Kate, um, is great um, to have. And really just immediately the process was super straightforward and simple. Uh, Saturday morning, pretty quick meeting, went very smoothly, um, took a lot less time than we thought. Um, so then the next biggest sort of, I think, complication for us was going through the um, social work or the paperwork that asked us really pretty invasive questions about uh, our health, we had to go get our doctors to sign things off. Um, you know, we have mental health stuff in our backgrounds. We have, um, my partner has been sober for uh, 15 years. Um, you know, we have stuff in our backgrounds that uh, we wouldn't wanna disclose necessarily. We had to send financial statements. Like nobody really wants somebody they don't know to be looking at their bank statements and their credit reports. Um, and it felt, of course, then like doubly awful because other, because not everybody has to go through this, right? So it's like when you're a parent, um, a heterosexual parent, you're not having anybody sort of analyze that about you. Um, but we had a lovely social worker who was incredible, came to our house, met with us very briefly, um, did not do some like invasive home visit. We were really concerned about like, do we have outlet covers and do we have like a rotary phone? I mean, there's like weird stuff, right? That you hear about. Um, and she was totally amazing, very much set um, us at ease around that. Um, was incredibly like, not apologetic, but very understanding and empathetic about how intense the process was and how um, it would make us feel. Um, and then basically we just sort of submitted these things and it went off into the ether and Kate and the social worker and I'm sure other uh, incredible people at QLA kind of made it happen. Um, we showed up at um, the King County Superior Court. We had a lovely judge um, and it was, I mean, it was all very simple. So I actually feel like the process for me um, was way less anxiety producing than it could have been. And in part, just because it felt like there was this network. So even when we asked a couple of questions of Kate and she was like, I'm not sure about that. Um, it seemed like she had people to go kind of check in with and that was really nice too. So we mostly just, we didn't feel like we were on our own. So, yeah. Yeah, does, does anybody have a, wait. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask a parent who's been through it? Um, so it sounds like you had a good experience with a social worker under the gross circumstances of having to do it. Um, what, if anything, could the social worker have done to make it even more of a either positive or less burdensome experience? Yeah. Um, so I do know that when we were in the process and we were having conversations with friends, um, there was like a variety of experiences and it sounded like some people said, well, my social worker, and not in the clinic, right, but outside of the clinic, um, some people said, oh, my social worker didn't ask for any of that paperwork. And so it wasn't clear if it was like, necessary or recommended. And so I don't know that that's for a personal, like individual social worker, but maybe more for the process, just figuring out, is that like legally necessary or is it um, something that's sort of a recommendation? Is it a personal preference? 
Um, because like it was the process of doing that that felt right. And like having to send something over to your doctor and disclose like that you're going through this process when you might not otherwise have. So um, yeah, I think that would be useful. Um, I, I don't know that I minded having, um, having the meeting in our home, but I do think that that's something to, to maybe consider. Like for us, it was fine. Um, but I think for other others, it might feel even invasive even to just have a meeting in their home. Um, you know, it, I think people have a lot of feelings about strangers in their space, but also like, are people gonna judge me if I, whatever, right? Like name it. Um, so that might be useful. Um, and I think that that's, again, I don't know, right, what's like permissive, per, you know, permitted in terms of the legal pieces, but just from my um, perspective, I think that would be helpful. Um, yeah, I think that those are the things that kind of come to mind really immediately. Yeah. So my question is, um, how, what, what Kate did that was effective for you in explaining the legal process. But before you answer it, I actually need to ask the room at large um, something completely unrelated. So I'm commandeering for Go just for one minute. Yeah. Um, did we ran out of sandwiches? So did it, it, did anybody want a sandwich and not get one? Don't be shy. Did anybody want a second sandwich and not get one? Don't be shy, because we can get more. Okay, everybody's good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think what was useful for us was that um, I ask a lot of questions and um, I felt like all of those questions were kind of welcome. Um, and I, and I felt like what Kate did was sort of start with like, this is the minimal amount you kind of need to know. And then invited like, do you want more information about this? Um, and I think like my partner is like great with the minimal, minimal amount. Um, so that really worked in that case. And then I could ask some additional questions. Um, either out of curiosity or just to kind of feel a little bit more grounded in the process. Um, because I think like our primary concern was like, okay, we have this person, um, our friend who donated sperm. We worked with a lawyer, you know, in 2013 or something um, and had a contract drawn up, but it wasn't clear to us like, how much legal standing that had, it was done in color, like all these things. And so in some regards, I like, I, you know, I, I, I want information about that, but I don't necessarily want all of the details. I kind of just wanted like, oh yeah, that's fine, right? It's gonna work out and that's what I got. Um, but yeah, I think the bare minimum was really useful. Starting there, anyway. Does anybody else have a question? How did you find out about the cl clinic initially? Um, I had a friend who, um, or I have a friend who is a social worker, um, who I think, a queer social worker, um, who I think maybe got an email kind of rec recruiting social workers. Um, and then, um, so kind of said like, this is coming, so keep your eye out. And we were like, okay, we're like, what do we need to do? And I think I even emailed before it was like official. <laughs> it was like, put us on your list. Um, so yeah, it was like networks. I do know that once um, we had gotten our spot, I saw it come up in other places, but mostly like social media is where I saw it. Um, so in, I'm in some queer parenting groups. Um, that's primarily where I saw. Anyone else? All right, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You, you don't, guys don't need to stick around or anything else. Uh-huh, okay, thank you. Thank you all for doing yeah. this, I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So my name's Megan Dawson, and this is Laura. Everyone knows Laura already. Um, I have a uh, private practice 
um, here in Seattle. And um, I'm extremely passionate about working with poly, queer, non-conforming, all the kinds of families that are not traditionally um, considered in uh, in the what it looks like the the standard um, what people think means. Sorry, my I'm losing my words right now. Uh, a traditional family. So, um, so I was really excited to put this presentation together with Laura. Um, so the the reason that we are even here today is because. Uh, Non-traditional families continue to gain more protections and legal recognitions, uh, legal recognition um, from the step-parent adoption uh, process that was initially um, something that people could adopt their stepchild without the um, birth parents giving up custody, um, giving up their rights. And that's where we got the second parent adoption process. And now we have the third parent adoption process, which is, I know I didn't hear Cynthia's um, presentation earlier, but I'm sure she talked a little bit about how that um, process has been um, exciting and kind of not, to it's not totally spelled out in the, <laughs> um, it's not exclusively uh, spelled out. So we, we kind of, we do it permissively. We try to, try to um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my words. <laughs> um, yes, thank you, Laura. Um, but basically, uh, we're doing it, you know, kind of by the grace of God. We are, uh, we're doing it without, um, we're hoping that people don't catch on and, <laughs> and outlaw it um, or prevent us from confirming those parental rights. So, um, so it's really exciting here in Washington that that's even possible. Many other states it's not. Um, so uh, yeah, so. Okay, so when talking about family law for marginalized families, <laughs> Megan had this phrase, which I was like, yes where nothing about a parent is irrelevant, but relevance is very subjective. Mm -hmm. Kind of what we've been talking about. This is such a concrete process, but yet there's so much that's subjective. And so our goal, and especially for those of us working as social workers, is really how do we reframe and refocus on strengths of parents and families? How do we make this process as empowering or at least as least bad as possible. Um, and so talking, I know Andy had mentioned about things like mental health history and substance use history and things like that, really talking about not, I think a lot of families are like, maybe we just shouldn't mention it. But of course, then it comes up with the doctor's form, things like that. And we say, you know, we can talk about this in a way that is a strength of your family. Similarly, with a lot of non-traditional families and other things like this, like this is legitimate and let's talk about all the ways that your process has benefited your family. Um, yes, we do know that sexual orientation, transgender status, sexual conduct should not be used to decide parenting plans in Washington state. But I feel like kind of the whole theme of today is like, this shouldn't be a thing, but it still is. And that's why we're here. So obviously trickier in your actual practice. So um, essentially, the, in practice, I want you to be able to take to your clients um, the best practices, a way to affirm a person's, uh, how they see their family in ways that we can present to judges in the court system without harming them um, any further, you know, because there, there, are, there is discrimination that we're all uh, dealing with, and that's something that we, we don't want to add to that. Um, so the first thing is um, you really need, they, people define themselves. So ask uh, if you don't fully understand this, um, just ask for a clarification. The, I mean, I email clients and I say, hey, how do you want to, um, how do you want me to just talk to you about your status in uh, in the agreement versus in person, you know, you may be um, having a baby, but you may not, uh, you know, identify anything but the fact that you're, um, that you have a uterus and that you're using it to have a baby. Um, but otherwise, nothing about you uh, has any relation to wanting to be, you know, uh, assigned a feminine pronoun or 
uh, any kind of female um, characteristics. And so tell me how you describe yourself. And so um, if you can do that uh, to begin with, that's the kind of the best practice. If there are any questions, it's we'd be happy to answer those questions. Um, but obviously there's the issue of dealing with dead names in the, <clears throat> the legal world, um, like people who are, have been married before, uh, the name you used to use is obviously going to be relevant to the court to some extent, but we want to minimize as much as possible um, that re-traumatization for our clients who are just sick of hearing that name. And every time they hear it, it makes them, you know, experience dysphoria. And so um, the best thing that I like to do is to uh, include a footnote uh, explaining exactly why I'm using what, which pronouns uh, in any of my pleadings and just say, you know, um, Joe Smith is, um, was uh, born X, Y, Z. And uh, he doesn't, he, he's uh, changed his gender marker and his name on his legal documents. Um, and so I'm only going to refer to him by that name. Um, he was formerly known as dead name, but um, that's, not, that's not how I'll refer to him in any of my legal uh, pleadings. Um, and so that is, it's really important. Um, it really makes a big difference in feeling like you're an actual advocate for your client. I know it doesn't seem like much, but um, or it doesn't seem like it's um, a, as maybe as big of a deal, but it, it is really a big deal if you can uh, buffer some of the trauma that going through this legal process may uh, cause to your clients. Um, and, and essentially, even if uh, someone's legal pronouns haven't been changed, you can still refer to them by the correct pronouns in your legal documents, and you just explain to the court why you're doing it that way. Um, this is something that uh, I've come up against um, with opposing counsel or potentially judges, not so much in King County, but with opposing counsel using dead names or using uh, the wrong pronouns um, referring to parents as mother or father, that's pretty common. And there are rules of professional conduct that um, you can use to remind people of what it actually, what what is um, considered to be non-professional conduct. So the RPC 8.4 D uh, states that it's professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to, to the administration of justice. It's prejudicial to call someone by the wrong name. It's prejudicial to call someone by the wrong pronoun. And if it keeps happening, that's something that you can write a really strongly worded email to opposing counsel um, or a letter to opposing counsel, letting them know that they need to stop doing that. And there's ways in which you can obviously uh, pursue professional conduct um, uh, uh, sanctions against them if they continue to do it. Most of the time, my experience has been people don't realize that they're doing it. Um, and I just will send an email saying, I'm, we need to stop, you know, don't refer to my client uh, as uh, their dead name anymore. Like that's inappropriate. This is not, gonna, this is not acceptable. Um, and, and usually it's corrected. Um, the other one is 4.4a, uh, where it says that in representing a client, a lawyer shall not use means that have no substantial purpose other than to embarrass, delay, or burden a third person, or use methods of obtaining evidence that violate the legal rights of such a person. And that basically just, you know, I, I would argue that this is, uh, you know, misgendering someone intentionally, misnaming someone intentionally is intended to embarrass or harass someone through the legal process. I have not um, encountered a judge necessarily doing this the wrong way, um, doing this incorrectly and misgendering or dead naming someone, but it, I'm sure it happens and I'm sure it happens in more um, counties outside of King, um, but there is a code of judicial conduct that also uh, basically states that the court has to follow certain uh, procedures and it's um, a judge shall not in the performance of judicial office, including administrative duties, duties um, shall 
shall not, sorry, I'm, uh, shall not, in the performance of judicial duties by words or conduct or manifest bias or prejudice um, or engage in harassment and shall not permit, permit court staff, court officials, or others subject to the ju judge's direction uh, or control to do so. So a judge has, an, uh, has a duty to correct anyone in the courtroom, including the bailiff, if they're using the wrong pronouns or name for a client. Um, and the judge can also force lawyers to um, to follow this. And that's something that, you know, uh, that's what uh, 2.3C says, that a judge shall require lawyers in proceedings before the court to refrain from manifesting bias or prejudice or engaging in harassment against parties, witnesses, lawyers, or others. Um, and there are some comments that explain that further, but if you do come into the contact with a um, an intentionally uh, resistant opposing counsel or judge, uh, you should let us know and we can help you with some of the wording um, on how to give them a strongly worded reprimand uh, to prevent that from happening in the future. Okay. So a lot to say here about terminology, <laughs> particularly for trans families. I would say the biggest role of the professional here is to first understand what are the words that people use for themselves in their family and then to help reach an agreement about what words are acceptable to use in the legal sphere because those aren't always going to be the same and there's no way to know until you ask. So um, really easy tips here. So you don't ever need to say mother and father. Parent one, parent two is all over Washington, right? Um, and so never assume what words people use, particularly um, in a lot of lesbian families. You'll hear, you know, one mom is mom and one is baba or other words. And so it can be helpful for you to know, even though you are probably not going to write baba anywhere in your paperwork, helpful for you to know what those words are so that when you're just talking to the family, you make sure you know who they're talking about or who kids might be talking about. Um, and then agreeing, okay, what word does each parent want? I know that there are some parents who really say, you know, I really don't identify with femme stuff or anything, but I am a mom and that is the word I use. So they don't want the word parent used. Or some people that say like, you know, I want it to be parent no matter what my gender is. Um, for non-binary parents, always checking on pronouns. So using they, them, uh, using zizier, which we see a lot less on the West Coast than we do in other parts of the country, but definitely still exists. So um, making sure that you know how to use those. If you don't, the internet is your friend. And also, like Megan said, footnote it and move on. Um, and if you, again, if you can't, if you feel like something is unclear, there's almost always an alternative. So we have lots of people who say, but they could be plural. How do we know if we're talking about the individual or the couple? It's not hard. You can literally just say, <laughs> you know, parent one, parent two, or say the family and in another sentence say the person's name. So there's almost no issue with where you're really going to have a problem figuring out the multiple piece of they, them. Um, for biological parents, so a lot of words here that are kind of unnecessarily gendered. Um, again, I think people I think a lot of us, even when really well-intentioned, are used to just words that might be a little bit out of date. So you hear people say like things like the parent is female bodied, but if you're a trans man, that may, that term may feel really pretty icky. It's a clinical term for you. Uh, and so things like that, or people will say like, well, it's breastfeeding because this person hasn't had top surgery, but that person might refer to their body as their chest. So is it, you know, checking, a lot of times chest feeding can be an inclusive term for anyone, regardless of what's going on in their body. Um, that can be an easy one. <laughs> Artificial insemination, artificial reproduction, you can say assisted. It's a lot better than talking about someone's fake reproduction. Um, gestational parent. So a lot of times, and you hear this in social work and in the law, people will talk about the real parent, by which people mean the biological parent, but of course, like, what people often mean is the gestational parent, but again, you have people that have done things like reciprocal IVF, right? Where it might be one person's egg and one person gestating. Therefore, both of them are biological parents. So use the terms you actually mean. Use gestational parent, genetic parent, whatever. Um, 
egg, sperm, gamete, embryo, all of those are good terms you can use. Um, I think particularly sometimes in more conservative places, you'll hear people talk about like the baby, which kind of gets into a more like odd pro-choice place. Uh, and sometimes people are like, let's just talk about the embryo, shall we? That, that's what we're talking about right now. Or people will talk about like sperm and say like male genetic material, like it's not male, it's just sperm, okay? So again, like what are we actually trying to say? Um, again, talking about in practice, things I've read in reports. Um, one thing I read once was since mom was infertile, other mom is not real, or other mom was not real parent, or like this person was real mom. Ooh, nobody likes to read that. So different ways you can say things that don't need to be offensive would be like parent one and parent two are unmarried. Or parent one used parent two's egg to carry the child and assisted reproduction was via, was via IVF. First attempt was unsuccessful. unsuccessful. Um, work with a lot of couples where they might have first used one person's uterus and then the other person's uterus. And I've literally read reports that were like, first person failed at getting pregnant. <laughs> other person, other person had to try. And I was like, ooh, ouch. So even things like, you know, parent two then attempted intrauterine insemination after X number of attempts. You know, just language that we wouldn't cringe for our people to actually read about themselves. Um, clients definitely might need support in defining what information is or is not relevant. I know there's a lot of things that we've talked about in this process of being, you know, it sucks that we have to ask this, we wish we didn't, but we do. There's some stuff though that we really don't. So for example, when is someone sex assigned at birth relevant? Um, if we're talking about conception and fertility, that might be relevant, right? So, or other, you know, biology. So saying parent one, uh, and then if you're talking about, for instance, a trans man, you know, used their uterus to conceive via IVF. Okay, might be totally appropriate, right? But if you have a scenario where this person is the adoptive parent, not the gestational parent, we don't need to know about their uterus or about their transgender status or any of that because it's not relevant to the work we're doing. And again, we don't need to give information for people to poke into that's not relevant. Um, so really helping, helping clients see like, okay, where do we need to have your former legal name listed and how, and where can we just totally bypass this discussion? Um, okay, so now we're going to move into the polyamorous family practice. Um, obviously, polyamorous families can also be transgender families or queer families. I mean, that's that's the whole point of this is that lots of the families that we are uh, helping in this clinic are um, it's discriminated against in lots of different ways. But one of one way in which the court system does sometimes look at uh, families in a negative light is um, related to uh, monogamous practices or non-monogamous practices. So we've always had non-monogamous families, um, but really uh, the changing nature of family law has allowed them to come out of the shadows and in this wonderful state, um, there are more and more ways in which we can affirm um, those kinds of families. Um, so the court, we should direct the court, but also um, the court is is more concerned with um, the habit, basically how they parent, how parents parent rather than what their sexual preference is or their sexual habits. Um, and so we do have a, a court case uh, that um, that held that a parent's sexual orientation or sexual conduct can't be used to restrict residential time um, unless the conduct endangers a child's physical, mental, or emotional health. And, you know, lots of families are, uh, you know, people have stuff on the internet. That is, that's definitely a thing. And uh, that w what someone has, you know, what they do in their private life is not going to always be relevant to how they parent. And it's really important that we uh, help them define that in ways that uh, are in line with the law. Um, <clears throat> So polyamorous families or non-monogamous families exist in all kinds of different structures. Uh, we don't need to get into every detail of that, but basically there's more than one parent, usually more than two parents, and 
Um, they are all involved in child rearing. Um, sometimes they're biologically related to a child, sometimes they're, no one is. Um, and it can take many forms. Um, what we want you to understand is that uh, we as practitioners need to be focusing on the, how the family functions. Um, and we can assist doing that by uh, focusing on their, uh, like literally, what is your role in the family? Do you wash dishes? Do you bathe the kids? Who are, you know, who takes the, who goes to the, the, the kids' parent-teacher conferences? Um, who is the person that takes you to the doctor? You know, those are the kinds of things that the court cares about. That's what we should be gathering in our, um, in our interviews with clients. And so, you know, the, who's, who's in a sexual relationship with who is not relevant to this process. And we should disclose to the court in so far as, um, as, as the family is structured and how um, those kinds of caregiving roles are laid out. That's how we, how we should frame things rather than the sexual or romantic relationships of the party parties, because we know that um, that doesn't always make a family. Um, so we're going to do this one, right? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, this all me. Oh, sorry. I'm um, so basically um, we have the new UPA. We already covered that with uh, the de facto parentage, parentage um, uh, practice that uh, we went over, I think, in the first in, um, the first presentation, um, this uh, doesn't require that parents are married, which is great, um, so that you can have somebody who is not necessarily, uh, who's not cre uh, committing bigamy in the state. Um, so they just live with the kids and otherwise um, they function in all the ways uh, like a parent. Um, and that's really to distinguish them, the, um, the tests that, I know that we already went over this, but just to reiterate, um, they're not a glorified babysitter. They're not receiving any compensation. Um, they are doing this because they are, have an intent to parent the child and they've been doing it for a long time. The child is bonded with them. And so um, having the uh, UPA um, codify de facto parentage is extremely helpful for uh, polyamorous and non-monogamous non families. So again, focusing on using a family's own terms to define their relationships. Um, folks that may be less familiar with non-monogamy or um, have their own opinions about non-monogamy will often phrase things in ways that might be less accurate and sometimes less flattering. Uh, so something like mom and dad are married and their girlfriend or whatever is going to adopt the child because they've been a caretaker for a long time. Right, and that may or may not actually be representative of the situation and very much privileges, right? Like this is a legal marriage and this is kind of a random other person which may not represent their family and may actually feel pretty offensive. So other ways you can talk about this, again, not focusing so much on romantic and sexual relationships where they're not relevant. So parents one, two, and three have lived together since 2015. All parents sh share home finances and legal documentation such as mutual power of attorney, medical decision-making, et cetera. Um, all three parents planned the pregnancy together. They planned that parent two would carry, parent one would contribute sperm, and third parent adoption would be uh, pursued ASAP after birth to secure parent three's rights. Again, showing the intent. Things that were not in here. Mention of, re of romantic, sexual, other things that are, again, not relevant. And then talking about what terms will be used in court that are respectful and accurate. Some of the ones at the bottom are more terms that you might, again, things like mama and baba, you might not hear so much. People might refer to their family as their polycule, or people might refer to their partner's partner as their metamor. I will say a lot of judges are gonna be like, huh? So we might explain to families that that might not be the language we would use. We might talk about their family unit, their family members, their co-parents, their chosen family. There are all these other words that we can use that again, focus on the definition of family, but not on the details of what types of relationships everyone is in besides a familial relationship, which is what we're talking about. Okay, um, and now we're gonna transition to um, 
the ways in which families uh, may not have the perfect record. Um, obviously, we've heard from the um, parent who um, who was, you know, worried about how the court or a social worker would come in and judge them. Obviously, um, we are going to have to deal with that. Uh, there might be some negative uh, issues that you have to address in either the, you know, how you even bring about uh, the confirmation of their parents' status, um, the confirmation of those, their legal rights may be effective, affected um, by the history, you know, whether we're talking mental illness, um, formerly incarcerated people, um, domestic violence, that's another one that um, we'll go over, but basically we're defining it, anything that a court might consider to be bad. Um, and we want to frame it in a way that um, is as affirming and as respectful as possible. But we also want to be clear with our clients how a judge may or may not see this and why we have to perhaps um, go one route over another, you know, essentially, um, is this something that is going to come up? Is this something that the social worker will talk to you about? Um, will it be a factor in the parentage action? Will it be something that the judge wants to know more about? Um, is, is a judge going to ask for a guardian ad litem or another uh, court-appointed um, advocate to look into these issues? And that could be really invasive, you know? So if we, if we see that coming down the line, it's helpful to kind of flag that um, if you have anything come up like that, talk to us. We have lots of people with experience who would be happy to kind of talk you through that and how to um, present those issues and, and the possible outcomes to uh, clients. So, so the first uh, issue is uh, private prior incarcerations or criminal history. Obviously, with the social worker report, they're going to pull a watch report, which uh, is required for all adoptions. The parentage process does not require that the criminal history of a party be disclosed in order to confirm de facto parentage. Um, you, you really want to ask for an honest <laughs> accounting from your client of what might uh, what might come up and and you know families may not disclose this information to you but you you do want to make it clear that obviously um, you are you are bound by confidentiality and it's critical for you to be able to represent their interests and how to uh, present this information to the judge they have to be honest with you um, and uh, this can be especially challenging if you are um, looking for affirmative action. So you're you're asking to affirm a, a, a relationship that already exists. Um, so sometimes that means that you're going to have uh, clients who may not know. I mean, hopefully, if folks are raising kids together, they know each other's criminal history or former incar formerly incarcerated history. But that's not always the case, and that's something that they need to know that. Uh, if that could come out, could come out in the process, and that could be disclosed to the other parent. Um, confidentiality is waived between the parties to the extent necessary to represent them effectively, and so you know that stuff is is you know there kind of there are no secrets um, if we're we're going forward as as representatives. As, a, as the attorney um, representing them. Um, and then if, if they suddenly, you know, obviously this is, we don't want this to happen, but if things do become problematic um, and their interests are no longer aligned, um, you can't continue to represent them. Unfortunately, they're gonna have to both get their own counsel at that point. So it's really important to be clear that that could be the outcome, that they're waiving that because of um, the way that this process works, and um, and and that they know that it's uh, this is going to obviously expose them in a lot of ways. So um, the other issue is uh, domestic violence. So domestic violence is often something that uh, could come up in in a, the history of a party. Um, sometimes partners have. Uh, 
this is their you know second kid and they were formerly with another partner and um, so they're they're co-parenting with different uh, co-parents and um, you know they're it's it's possible that um, that individuals can use history a history of domestic violence or potentially um, violent acts to define a person's characteristics. Um, that's the statutory definition is that it's a, it, um, in uh, Washington state, it means a, um, it's RCW uh, 26.09, uh, I'm forgetting the number, Kate knows. Um, but uh, so it's physical harm, body, bodily injury, assault, or the infliction of fear of imminent physical harm, bodily injury, or assault between family members. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, there's a statutory definition. One, a one-off event is not necessarily gonna qualify as uh, domestic violence, but it is something that the courts look at. Negative conduct, um, it, it can have restrictions. It can cause uh, parenting plans to have restrictions in them. And we wanna make sure that we focus on, you know, if we know that a person um, had a DVPO or a domestic, that's a domestic violence protection order in their past with a former partner, but they haven't had any of those issues since then, or they went through a rehabilitation program, uh, process and they actually um, did some classes and did a lot of therapy on it. And that's something that they're actively working on. And that's not an issue in the current relationship, but we know it was an issue in the past. How do we, you know, how do we frame that? in our pleadings and in our social worker reports um, to characterize it in the right way. Um, the other thing is that uh, adoptions require a post-placement report um, and that is not necessarily something that every parent is gonna pass. And so, you know, or maybe they don't want to have that kind of an invasive process um, for, for any number of reasons, uh, we may recommend that uh, parentage actions, a parentage action be the preferred um, action. Even though adoptions are final, parentage actions can be appealed, and so they're not as um, they're not as final. Um, so that's something that you know you would want to discuss the two routes depending on the family um, and and what might be the best. Um, the best process to go through, and then and then they can make a decision with you on how you want to proceed to affirm their parental rights. So, um, does anyone have any questions about that? I know that that's a little bit confusing. Um, no, okay. Um, yeah. So, talking a little bit on the mental health side, I know this has been mentioned several times today. Again, emphasizing that. Uh, really from the perspective of the forms provided uh, to us for the social work report. If you have any history of mental health treatment, even just seeing a counselor, just because, that is something that they are asking you to disclose. And with that, to then provide an amended statement to say why, to give some context. So around things like mental health, substance use, et cetera, I think context is really key, right? We know what the perspective of the court is kind of from these, uh, the forms that we have, which is not necessarily super supportive, right? Not seeing taking care of your mental health as just like a proactive thing or a good thing, but of really saying like this requires explanation. So here giving that context to help better represent our clients. So talking about something, particularly with mental health, something that is a pattern versus isolated incident. So for example, um, someone might say, well, this parent has a history of mental health hospitalization and that makes me worry about their ability to be present for caregiving. Well, is this, let's say, someone who had a mental health hospitalization at a new onset of bipolar two, and then from there was able to be successful in outpatient treatment and for the most part has been out and managing their daily responsibilities since then? Or is this someone who's had a repeated history of hospitalizations lasting weeks at a time and not following up with outpatient treatment? Because those are two really different things that could easily be categorized the exact same way. Um, 
talking about treatment. So um, particularly, this also goes into criminal history a little bit. Are people participating in the services that have been recommended and or required? So for instance, if someone has a CPS history, have they attended those parenting classes that were either required or strongly recommended? If family counseling has been recommended after a DV incident, did they participate and complete? Um, making restitution, so if someone was, you know, had a criminal history that involved, you know, let's say graffitiing in their community as a young adult, did they do the community service and clean it up? Um, regaining stability. So this is really big, especially when people have concerns about things that have a history of relapse, like substance use. So what are people doing to maintain stability? Are they going to therapy? Are they going to meetings? Are they in an outpatient program? Um, and then the idea of active recovery versus kind of continuing to downward spiral. So if you're seeing that this person has gone from hospitalization to jail to hospitalization to jail and back and forth, but not participating in any kind of services to make recovery versus someone who has, again, discovered that there's an issue going on and then followed a treatment plan, those are really different. And we don't want the court to necessarily see them as the same when we feel like our client is doing a really strong job working towards recovery. Um, mentioning mental health evaluations in here, those can be very helpful. Um, I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier with non-traditional families, sometimes there's this kind of line that you straddle of giving more information to show that these are actually super good parents, even though people might not be familiar with this type of family, or are we giving more information that's gonna then cause to ask more questions and kind of set a precedent? So it can be a little bit of tricky, like we talked about earlier, if you're selecting a mental health therapist, a social worker, et cetera, really getting someone that understands family law, that understands the background that your family is coming from. Um, thank you. And I mean, really just obviously the, each family is going to have their own uh, issues that are unique. Um, so if you have a question for any reason and you're like, I don't know how, you know, the fact that this person has a child that they never, you know, uh, took care of and, you know, they had a CPS history or something like that um, in the past, how is that going to affect their current um, their current application or uh, petition. Um, so we would want to, you know, ask some questions. We'd start, we'd talk to each other, uh, the family law practitioners who have come up against these issues. You know, I mean, a lot of what we're doing is creative. And so we are going to, we're going to figure out how do we, you know, use something that has already been done maybe in a different context? How do, how do we do this in a way that's going to be successful and is, is what is best for this family um, to make sure that they can jump through the court hoops that they need to jump through in order to have the same legal status as straight people? So um, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, Denise can connect you with us if you have any questions. So all right, thanks. <laughs>